Before diving into this video, here is a list of things you should be comfortable with or at least familiar with beforehand. I normally don't add these to my videos, but this video's difficulty is not typical of my channel's target audience, so I want to set some clear expectations. With that out of the way, let's get started. <laughs> How? What? Mathematicians are always on the lookout for identities, for many good reasons. Not only are many of them very practical and useful, but underlying many identities are profound concepts to be learned. On top of the fact that these identities can be very important, they can oftentimes be very beautiful as well. Imagine you were doing a math problem and manage to find a summation for the answer, but you want to know if there's a closed form solution. In other words, is it possible to find an identity to represent the sum without the summation notation? Perhaps once you see the closed form, the proof would be relatively easy. Perhaps you might not know where to begin, especially if the summation is very complicated and ugly. Perhaps a closed form just doesn't exist, but it would still be nice to know for sure. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a simple method by which we could provably find the closed form if it exists, and guarantee that one doesn't exist if the method fails? It turns out for a very large class of identities, this is true. Although the method is very simple in concept, the algebra work involved even for simple examples can be very tedious. But with the advent of computer algebra systems, we can just throw these identities into a computer and it will do all the work for us. However, we probably don't want to just blindly trust the computer. After all, math can be very tricky and there's always a possibility of an error somewhere, which is why we expect rigorous proofs of our results. Fear not, because the computer can help us here too. Not only can the computer find a closed form, it will also spit out a certificate that we mere humans can use to verify the proof. Does this sound too good to be true? I thought so too. Some people were even a little bit disheartened to hear this was the case, because they feel like this takes the fun out of finding and proving identities. But there is still an immense value in studying individual identities. Just because the search and verification of many of these identities is now a routine computer task doesn't mean that there isn't anything valuable to be learned. The manual search for some of these identities and answers has led to the development of entire fields of math that would probably have gone undiscovered had these computer methods existed. Because mathematicians needed to find answers without the help of a computer, it motivated some beautiful discoveries that they would have skipped over had they used a computer shortcut. These computer shortcuts shouldn't take the fun out of discovering and proving identities. As the mathematicians who discover these techniques write, it merely moves the fun to a different level. I'm inclined to agree. Now let's get started. For starters, we need to clarify that we aren't going to be covering every possible identity. Unfortunately, that much is just not possible. We are only going to be covering a class of identities called hypergeometric identities involving hypergeometric series. The good news though, is that hypergeometric series are incredibly general and powerful. Hypergeometric series can be used to define all kinds of other functions. Here is just a small sample of the different identities involving hypergeometric series. Hypergeometric series cover exponents, logarithms, trig functions, gamma functions, Bessel functions, even the Fibonacci sequence, just to name a few. So what exactly is a hypergeometric series then? First, Let's talk about what geometric series are. In a geometric series, there is a constant factor between each term of the sequence, and we sum the sequence. In a hypergeometric sequence, the factors between terms are not constant, but outputs of a rational function. And once again, we sum the terms from zero to infinity. A lot of summations are actually hypergeometric, even though it may not look like it at first. Take this sum for instance. Let's take the successive term ratio, simplify, and voila! It's a rational function relative to k, what we are summing over, 
so it's hypergeometric. So you've seen this hypergeometric function notation a lot already, so let's go over what it means and how to write functions in terms of this notation. The key lies in this function, the ratio between successive terms. Factor out the numerator and the denominator, then gather the constants added to the variable. That's what goes into the array part of the hypergeometric function. Ah, wait, I forgot to mention a very important detail. We have to ignore an m plus 1 term in the denominator, pretend it doesn't exist. There's no special mathematical reason for doing this. The reason we do this is almost entirely historical and just by convention. It doesn't quite make sense, but it's always been done this way. If your denominator doesn't have an m plus 1 term, just add an m plus 1 to both the numerator and denominator so they cancel out. Let's try one more example. Here's the function that is the ratio of my successive terms. First, we factor the top and bottom. Then, we pull out constant factors so that the leading coefficient of the variable is 1. Put an m plus 1 on the denominator since it doesn't exist, include it in the numerator too so it cancels, then gather the constants and the leading factor. Voila, we're done. This notation isn't that important to this video, but hopefully running through this example gives you a more hands-on understanding of what exactly a hypergeometric series is and gives you a concrete way to calculate the examples I showed earlier in the video. We are going to break down the computer's work into three major steps. First, the computer will find a closed form for a hypergeometric series when it exists, producing a solution for our identity. Secondly, it will generate the proof certificate for our identity, something we can use to verify that the identity is in fact true. And finally, we will take a look at how we can use the proof certificate to verify the identity, either by hand or also with computer algebra systems. Let's first look at how to use the proof certificates so we can get a better idea of what the computer is looking for in the first two steps. Before we go into the details of how the proof certificate works, we need to understand a concept known as telescoping. Telescoping will be the key concept by which we find closed form solutions to summations. We want to find a way to write our summation terms a of n as a successive difference of a function s of n. This way, each time we add a term of a of n, we also add these s of n terms in such a way that the middle terms cancel out. If we can find a function s of n that satisfies the first equation, then we will have our closed form for our summation. The key concept to understand here is that if we write our summation term as telescoping terms, then evaluating the summation is simple. Just take the last telescope term and subtract the first telescope term. Now that we have an idea of how telescoping works, we can now explain how the proof certificates work. Basically, there's a standard template of steps for the proof. All you have to do is plug in the rational function r, and the proof is done. Here are the steps to the proof. First, let's suppose that we are trying to find a proof that the sum of all t over k is equal to some closed form s. For now, let's also assume that we are summing a finite number of terms, that beyond some value for k, all of the terms are zero. This will be an important detail later on. The second step is pretty straightforward. Instead of proving our original identity, we can obtain an equivalent identity to prove by just dividing both sides by the closed form s. Our goal is now to prove that the sum of f over k is 1. The third step is where we plug in our proof certificate, the rational function r. Define g as the product of r and f. The fourth step is where the magic happens. If the proof certificate r is correct, we will be able to show that the following equation is true. If this equation turns out to be true, there is something really nice that happens. We can now sum both sides of this equation over all integers k. Notice that the side with g telescopes. Since the values of g are all zero beyond some value of k, the entire sum is just zero. All we need to do now is add the sum of f on both sides to see that the sum of f of n plus 1 is equal to the sum of f. Think about what this means. If we can just find a single f sum, 
then for any larger n value, the sum will be unchanged. This is simply the inductive step for step 5, which provides the base step. Once we show that plugging n equals 0 gives us 1, this guarantees that no matter what n is, the sum will always be a constant, and that constant is 1. Let's take a look at an example. Step 1. We write the identity that we want to prove. Step 2. We divide both sides by the right side and define our f function. Notice that we only need to prove this identity now. Step 3. Write out our proof certificate as a function r, and define g as the product of r and f. Throughout this video, I will shortcut a lot of the algebra, but feel free to check it yourself if you like. The functions f and g now form what we call a wz pair. Step 4. We plug our functions f and g into this equation and verify that it is true. Although this looks very intimidating, this is a very routine task that computer algebra systems already know how to prove. All you have to do is write each binomial coefficient in factorials, multiply out the denominator, combine and cancel like terms, and when everything cancels, the identity is proven. Step 5. Simply plug in n equals 0. Once we compute the sum to be 1, thanks to step 4, we know that it is a constant sum of 1 for all n. We're done. Now that we know how to use the proof certificate to verify the identity, you're probably excited to know the answers to the two questions that remain. First, how do we find the closed form? And secondly, how do we find the proof certificate? Let's take a look at finding the closed form now. We will learn one algorithm in particular, Gosper's algorithm. Gosper's algorithm on its own will not be enough to fully solve hypergeometric sums, but it should be an excellent starting point to show some of the basic ideas and techniques involved. If you're interested in how the other algorithms work to fully solve hypergeometric sums, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a follow-up video. The goal of Gosper's algorithm is to find a telescoping hypergeometric term. For now, just follow along with the algebra, and at the end, we will summarize the steps. First, define the z-telescoping terms that we're trying to figure out. If a closed form exists, z will be a hypergeometric term. Now let's define y like so. Notice that y is also a rational function, since z of n plus 1 over z of n is a rational function by the definition of the hypergeometric term. Define r which is rational by the same definition. Now we solve for z from the y definition, plug it into this equation here, and then divide by t of n on both sides. We have now reduced the problem of finding a closed form of the hypergeometric sum to finding rational solutions y of this equation. Now we define polynomials a, b, c, and a rational function x, such that these two relations are satisfied. Note that because x is a rational function, this can always be done. In fact, you can even include an additional condition, this one here. Let's take a closer look at what this condition is saying with an example. For starters, recall that a and b are polynomials. The only way that two polynomials have no non-constant common factors is if after factoring, there aren't any non-constant matching factors. Since none of the factors match in this example, the GCD is 1. However, we need b of n plus h to have no matching factors, not just b of n. Notice that in this example, if h is 2, we have a matching factor, which violates our stated condition. Essentially, all of the coefficients in b need to be bigger than the coefficients in a. Here, a and b fail our condition because there's a 3 in a and a 1 in b. So what do we do then if our a and b polynomials don't satisfy the GCD condition? Thanks to the way that polynomials a, b, and c are defined in R, we can take advantage of c to carry the factors that violate the condition, removing the problem factors from a and b. We give c the lower factor from b, and also every factor with coefficient in between, as shown in blue. 
when you obtain the ratio of c of n plus 1 and c of n, all of the blue factors cancel and the problem factors have been moved over to c. If there still exist more factors that would violate the condition, just continue this process and multiply them all together. Now that we've understood the setup, let's substitute our definitions of r and y into this equation. Here is where something magical happens. We mentioned before that x is a rational function. It turns out that we can prove that it is actually a polynomial. In this way, we have reduced the problem of solving for a rational function into solving for a polynomial. Let's prove that x must be a polynomial to be rigorous. We shall use a proof by contradiction by first supposing that x is rational. Write x as a fully simplified quotient of polynomials f and g, substitute, and multiply out the denominator on both sides. Once again, let's run through the logic using an example so it's easier to see. Suppose this is my g. Notice that no matter what value of n is input into g, the difference between the smallest and largest factor is 10. Focus on the smallest and largest coefficient factors in g, highlighted in yellow. Since n plus 7 divides g of n, n plus 8 divides g of n plus 1. This means n plus 8 divides the right side of the equation, which means it must also divide the left side of the equation for both terms. One of the terms already has g of n plus 1, but the other one doesn't. This means n plus 8 must divide either a of n, f of n plus 1, or g of n. It can't divide f of n plus 1, because f over g is fully simplified. It can't divide g of n, because the coefficient 8 in the factor is higher than the highest coefficient 7. Therefore, n plus 8 must divide a of n. Similarly, n minus 3 divides g of n, so it must divide b of n minus 1, f of n, or g of n plus 1. It can't divide f of n by definition, and it can't divide g of n plus 1 because the coefficient of minus 3 is too low. Therefore, n minus 3 must divide b of n minus 1. But this means n plus 8 must divide b of n plus 10, which is a problem now because a of n and b of n plus h share a factor, violating our GCD condition from before. This proves that g cannot have factors, and so x must be a polynomial. So to summarize Gosper's algorithm, we just use these definitions to find r, then the polynomials a, b, and c, and then we will have a recurrence relation for x, which, once we solve, we can substitute back to get our z. Let's try an example. Here is a summation we're trying to solve. In order to make solving it easy, we will try to rewrite the summation term as a telescoping term using Gosper's algorithm. First, we write out our summation term, which will help us define our successive ratio r. Next, we need to find the polynomials a, b, and c. Start by directly making the numerator and denominators into a and b. Our c just becomes 1 by default. Unfortunately, we have run into a problem. We have violated the GCD condition that we covered earlier. In order to fix this, we just take our problematic factors and move them to c accordingly. Notice that the ratio c of n plus 1 over c of n gives us the factors that we took out from a of n over b of n. All we need to do is plug them into this equation, and we're done. We have a recurrence relation for x. We just solve for x now. Um, wait a minute. How do we actually solve this recurrence? The process is actually quite straightforward. It's just very annoying to do. Assume the degree of the polynomial, and then just plug in and solve for the coefficients. If it doesn't work, try a higher degree. If you can show that there cannot possibly exist a solution no matter how high the degree, then there is no solution and therefore no closed form for the telescoping term. In this case, assuming that x is a quadratic gives us a solution. In more complex cases, there are various ways to estimate the degree of this polynomial to simplify this search. The rest is easy. 
plug x back to obtain our z term, which was the telescoping term we were looking for. Evaluating the closed form for this sum, while extremely tedious and obnoxious to do by hand, is just routine algebra at this point. Look at how nasty this innocent looking summation turned out to be. This isn't the most straightforward way to do this problem, but all of our steps were completely algorithmic and routine. Let's go back to the summation example in which we had a proof certificate. I have yet another small confession to make. I mentioned that if a sum for a summation exists, we would be able to use Gosper's algorithm to find it. However, if we try to use Gosper's algorithm on this sum, we will find that there is no solution. And yet, we clearly have a solution. What's going on? We know that if a telescoping term exists, then for any number of terms, we can find a closed form. We would have a formula for the sum over any k terms. However, just because a telescoping term doesn't exist, doesn't mean that we can't find a closed form for the entire sum. A closed form for the sum over any number of terms is called an indefinite sum, whereas a closed form only for the sum over a specific set of terms is called a definite sum. For those of you with some calculus background, it's the same with integrals. As long as we have the indefinite sum, definite sums are easy, but having a definite sum is in no way an indicator that the indefinite sum can be expressed. This is why we will need the other algorithms to fully solve the problem of finding the closed form of hypergeometric sums. So let's pretend that we managed to find the closed form. We just need the proof certificate now. Recall that to execute the proof, we need to divide the right side. Now let's take a quick look at the equation that the proof certificate needs to satisfy. Substituting on the left side is easy. Now we treat everything on the left side as a single term and just use Gosper's algorithm in terms of k to figure out the g function on the right side. The h function is properly hypergeometric and the end result of Gosper's algorithm will be our g. Once we have g, we just do g divided by f and we have our proof certificate. If Gosper's algorithm fails here, or if the proof certificate obtained fails to verify our identity using the method shown before, then we know that our identity is not true. While we won't go over all of the other algorithms in this video that fully solve the problem of finding a closed form for hypergeometric sums, this process of plugging in a recurrence into the left side in order to allow Gosper's algorithm to be applied is a subtle hint and preview at the approach employed in some of those algorithms. So there we have it, an introductory look at how to find a closed form for hypergeometric sums, and therefore, hypergeometric functions. If you enjoy this video, please check out the resource linked in the description, which is the source of the content in this video. It includes a more long-form, detailed description of the methods, including the algorithms that I didn't have time to go over, some background history and generalizations of these algorithms, as well as how to generate new identities from existing ones, written by the very people who developed many of these ideas. It is a fascinating and fantastic read, and includes exercises to practice on too. I'm also not an expert in this area, so if anyone has any criticisms, questions, or corrections, please leave a comment. For more content like this in the future, please like and subscribe and share the video. And as I mentioned before, please comment if you would like me to make a follow-up video going over the other algorithms. I appreciate each and every bit of support.